the honor of getting to speak at his uh, service. And uh, deep out of my heart, I started the uh, scholarship and uh, that next day basically gave $500 from my pocket to start it. And uh, it was a great way to honor an amazing man and uh, honor his legacy of recovery and his commitment of service to the community. So the purpose of the scholarship, don't have a clicker because we have too much, uh, too many things plugged in for the uh, virtual awards. But uh, the purpose of the scholarship is obviously, you know, many, many faceted, but one is to provide financial support. You know, any parent who's sending their kid off to college knows it's not a cheap date and costs a lot of money. Um, so we try and do as much as we can with fundraising and give as much money as we possibly can. And obviously, we're somewhat limited, but you know, our hope and goal is to find some millionaire, billionaire donor who can endow this, and we can give every student out there who deserves what they get should get as a free ride. Um, so that's our long-term goal, but we do as much as we can day in and day out to raise as much money as possible. So financial support is extremely important to us, but even equally as important is the emotional support. For anybody who grew up in a family with uh, addiction and violence, you know what it's like to be that kid. And uh, you know you, you pretty much feel alone. And I was one of those kids, so that's why it's so deep in my heart to, for, for, to do this scholarship, because I know when we, we give you that kind of emotional recognition, no, you know, very very few other places in our society do that. And uh, for me, it's just an, an honor and a gift to be a part of trying to tell kids like, hey, you're not alone. There's a community out here that believes in you and is going to support you. And uh, we welcome you to be a part of our community for the rest of your, you know, your life. We always welcome our uh, former students to come back and be judges and be a part of our uh, scholarship community. So deep from my heart, I welcome all the students tonight and uh, truly an honor to have you here. And all of our students who are virtual, welcome to all of you. You know, you can't be here in person, but you're here in our heart. Um, the third part of our scholarship is to promote awareness of youth addiction. Obviously, we've heard way too much about addiction in our society, and especially with young kids, the lack of resources out there. Many treatment programs for adolescents have closed in the past couple of years because of COVID. And so we're trying to raise awareness and also try and promote uh, service to the community. I think Al was that perfect example of what service to our community means. When he chose recovery, he was all about service. And so that's one of the things the scholarship tries to recognize. And in honor of Big Al, we try and recognize social and racial justice. Um, you know, Al grew up you know, with a lot of challenges and obviously felt that you know, sting of racism many times throughout his life. So we're trying to promote that. And then, like I said, last but not least, is always to remember Al's amazing legacy. I want to recognize uh, Herman Gowdy over here, who is Al's uh, sponsor. Can you stand on up, Herman? Go ahead and stand up, Herman. And uh, one of the gentlemen that Al brought into treatment after him, Charles Lott. Stand on up, Charles. Al and Al and Charles. Basically, Al brought his two running partners in with him. Uh, Doc, who uh, has passed away, I think 2012, and uh, Charles basically followed Al into treatment and all have had long-term recovery. And Charles is still here to uh, support the scholarship. And I truly appreciate that. So, thanks so much, uh, Charles. Um, so the scholarship financially, with our next slide here, um, yeah, like I said earlier, it's really about you know many facets, but obviously we, we understand the cost of going to college. So from that first $500, we actually have given away our most money ever this year, $86,000. And since it started in uh, 2006, a total of $876,000 has been awarded to Oregon high school seniors. Our next slide is about gratitude and thank thankfulness. Um, you know, it really takes a community to make this work. You know, and there's so many wonderful human beings out here who, who truly give from their heart to support each one of you students and all of our students who are attending virtually. So if we can get our, our scholarship judges and donors to stand up, please. All the folks who've donated to the scholarship and all the folks that have uh, written essays or scored the essays. So special place for my heart, just so much thanks and gratitude. I want to recognize two gentlemen up here at the front. So Steve Dean actually was here 10 years ago doing the, uh, supporting the scholarship with doing our keynote speech and uh, kindly wrote a couple articles which helped publicize the need of the scholarship. 
and it's kindly agreed to come back 10 years later and do it again. And then again, he's gonna write another article in the Oregonian for us. So special appreciation to Steve, thanks so much. And Luke Jackson, who's been a great friend of the scholarship, been just given so much out of his heart. He was actually our keynote speaker last year when we were on Zoom, but has just been a tremendous supporter, giving all kinds of uh, support and been a judge, I guess going on two years now, Luke, three? Two or three, but again, Luke's our former uh, NBA C Cleveland Cavaliers, played with LeBron, and he'll uh, be here tonight <laughs> handing out the awards. So uh, if you're a basketball fan at all, you can say you got it. If you get, if you get it from uh, Luke, you can say you got it from one of LeBron's teammates. And then I want to recognize uh, Tessa Fowler, who uh, just does such a great job with uh, supporting the kids. You know, she works from her heart, just has such a kind spirit and kind soul. So thanks so much, Tessa, for all your hard work. Pretty much all the behind scenes. You know, I recognize our uh, next speaker, and this is Kay Tran. Kay has been a champion of the scholarship. Kay has had many, many years in the state government working. She was actually the direct, former director of the child welfare system in the state of Oregon for many years, worked in other parts of government, has been the uh, CEO, president of Volunteers of America since 1999 has been a champion of the scholarship, helping basically allow us to give almost all the money that comes in straight to the scholarship. So truly appreciate all you've done, Case. Thanks so much. So we're about making your dreams come true. And hopefully uh, in a few years, you can be back supporting these uh, kids in five or 10 years and uh, be on to your pro wonderful professional careers. But again, to all the students, welcome from the you know, depths of my heart. Truly appreciate you all being able to come out. And uh, it's a gift and an honor to have be back in person and to recognize all of you and all of our uh, virtual participants. So thanks so much. Okay. Well, good afternoon. How's everybody? Okay. Can you hear me okay in the back there? Great. All right. And the next question I always ask is, can you see me? Because lecterns tend to be really high. Anyway, um, I first want to thank all of you for being here this evening. Um, this is such an important event, not only for the students that are winning awards, but also for the team that makes it all happen. So I want to thank you for being here, joining with us to say congratulations to our scholarship winners, but also just to celebrate the accomplishments that happen in an addiction treatment program. We are so proud of all of our seniors who are going to get scholarships. We're proud of you. Thank you for sharing your story. And you're going to hear more from them later in this event, but this is an important time for us to recognize their sharing, their success, and another giant step in their journey towards adulthood. I also wanna take just a moment to thank our fearless leader of MRC, and that's Greg Stone. As you heard, he has been leading this program for 32 plus years. That's a remarkable accomplishment. But more importantly than that, you can walk through our community, Portland's African-American community. You can walk through the larger community. You can walk through higher education, graduate programs, other programs, and you can hear this consistent theme about a person who's responsible for success and treatment, for recovery, for long-term commitment to family, and for keeping on track after they've uh, successfully graduated from our program. Greg is a star. And I want you to take a half a second here and stand up and thank him for his leadership. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. VOA Oregon is known for many success stories. We are a human service organization providing services to the full age continuum. We have a highly regarded program in early childhood where we're working with families, high-risk families that have a need for developmental services for children five weeks to five years of age, but who have parents that could lose support in terms of home visits, 
uh, parenting education and an effort to get them off to a good solid start, their children, as they begin their journey through school and eventually through adulthood. We also have on the back end of our continuum been providing services to the elderly. And that's been a service that's been very important to that population. As an organization, we've had our challenges post pandemic. So we are not providing the kinds of service that we did pre pandemic, but we recognize the need. And one of my jobs is to see how we can restore and reopen that in a way that we're able to provide those services to a larger population. We also have a very robust uh, domestic violence solution program. We're serving survivors with a variety of services that help those individuals get their lives on track. The largest part of our program, how, pro program portfolio, however, is in addiction treatment. We have two residential programs. We have the men's residential program, which you're seeing many of the team here today. And we also have the women's residential treatment program. In addition, we have outpatient services. In the community and in much of what you read and hear, you will hear that the problem of homelessness is the lack of a affordable housing supply. That's a symptom. There's many contributing factors to why people are homeless. And one of them is this horrible disease called addiction. Volunteers of America is excellent at providing those services. We have excellent outcomes. You can talk to the individuals who graduated from the programs. You can talk to their family and VOA Oregon, the Men's Residential Center, the Women's Residential Center has made a difference in their lives. And what I am trying to do is to elevate the conversation about what's causing homelessness for people to have a better understanding of the relationship between the disease of addiction and people's inability to get a job, inability to move into permanent housing. So it's very complex. It is simply not just a lack of housing supply. So join me in that conversation in the community to say we need to elevate the intervention strategies and funding of addiction if we really want to begin to turn the problem of homelessness around in our community. But I also want you to take the time and thank the VOA staff that does such an outstanding job of providing high quality services. So thank you. As Greg mentioned, we had a speaker 10 years ago who came, who listened, who participated in giving out the awards to the seniors who won scholarships. He's returned, and that's Steve Dean, a columnist from the Oregonian. And if you read his column, there's a theme. There's a theme that's always been present, and that theme is his high commitment to social and racial justice and the identification of barriers that prevent that from being how we live our lives and what we hope to have at one point in time, a beloved community. So I was real pleased when Greg said, Steve is returning because I'd like to hear where he is today with this issue, where he is today with the larger issue of our challenges when it comes to social and racial justice in our community and just where he thinks we need to go. But I wanna thank Steve for joining us this afternoon and for helping us to celebrate you wonderful seniors that are going to be getting scholarships to continue with your education. Thank you all so much. Hey, welcome. Um, it's great to have you here tonight. And by the way, Luke, if you're in the fold with this group of folks, you're doing something much more important than LeBron is hopefully losing to the Golden State Warriors in the next 10 days. Look, we're gathering together in interesting times, especially if you're in the whirlpool of addiction and recovery. As the Oregonian reported last month, 30 blocks of downtown Portland have metastasized into an open air fentanyl market where police generally ignore the carnage and despair until someone collapses in a doorway. The state's decriminal decriminalization of street drugs in 2020 was designed to treat drug users rather than incarcerate them, but Kate Brown's admi administration couldn't be bothered to do either. And when Secretary of State Shamia Fagan realized she couldn't survive on her $77,000 a year salary, 
did did she decide to moonlight with a healthcare provider or a foster care agency? No, she signed a consulting contract with a cannabis company, a company that doesn't pay its state and federal taxes, but donated 45,000 to her campaign. Um, in other words, donated money to the Democrat who regulates the industry or used to. Fagan re resigned this morning. I bring all this up just to point out that if you're Volunteers of America trying to stem drug and alcohol addiction rather than profit off it, you're swimming against the tide. But all are not lost. In a half hour or so, you're going to meet Sarah Essie Mathiason. She and I were introduced 10 years ago. When I spoke at this awards dinner in 2013, I talked briefly with her and two other scholarship winners, Guadalupe and Shatanya. Essie was 18 at the time. I don't know if she had a more compelling story than the other two young women when it came to surviving a family rife with drug and alcohol addiction, but I chanced upon her again 15 months after the banquet at a Baskin Robbins in West Lynn, where she was the store manager and cake decorator. We sat down later at a coffee shop and she told me much more about what it was like growing up in a family where your father is an alcoholic and your brother is an a-hole. Maybe a few of you, a few too many of you can relate. You know, you don't forget those stories. You don't forget her description of being locked for an hour at the age of five in a tiny dresser cabinet by her abusive older brother. I was small and limber, as he said, and easy to shove in things. You don't forget a young woman's experience at a kinesiology class at the East-West College of the Healing Arts. Whenever the professor needed or wanted students to understand the difference between scarred and healthy tissue, they would gently lay their hands on Essie. I was always the negative example, she said. I have a lot of past injuries, broken bones, that sort of thing. My brother pulled me off a chair. My brother tackled me into the fireplace. My brother pushed me off a bike. The injuries and concussions stack up. Scar tissue has a long memory. But what I remember most about that hour with Essie was the curious and complete lack of self-pity. She was so matter of fact, sitting in the sun, Listening for bitterness, all I heard was calm, even in the way she described her $4,000 Al Forth and Memorial Scholarship that was helping her get through massage therapy school. It's my terrible family scholarship, as he said. Congratulations, your family sucked enough. It paid off. Nine months ago, as you've heard, Greg called me again. He invited me back to that dinner. He wondered what I might find if I could track down any of the three women I met and wrote about in 2013. You know, you begin those quests with a certain skepticism and dread. When I wrote about Essie in 2014, the headline on the column was the relentless quest for a regular life. A regular life, small amounts of stability and kindness, a joyful family dinner now and then. What are the odds that any of us, much less, what are the odds for any of us for that, much less those who have grown up in the shadow of anger and addiction? Essie and I met last week at the Attic Lounge at Salishan Resort on the Oregon coast. And because she's also on tonight's program, I wanna leave her a little time and room to describe her journey from our first Al Forth and dinner to this one. But in our reunion at the Attic Lounge, I met a woman who finished massage therapy school and after a half dozen years of odd but oddly necessary jobs, found her way back to the healing arts, both at Salishan Spa and with private clients. When Essie had her first massage at 15, she'd never experienced that degree of nurturing. She wants to offer that to others, particularly those dealing with cancer, age, or disability. You have these bodies on a table opening up to you, as he says. I can see their body covered in scars. You can almost guess what they've been through. 
when they trust me enough to tell me about it, then let me touch their bodies. It's almost like an honor. These are not easy conversations. I can't think of a person I've interacted with on chronic pain that hasn't had a form of childhood trauma, as he says. But because she's pushed through hers, she can assist as they work through theirs. She can offer the safe, nurturing space she never had growing up in Canby. 10 years later, Essie admits to her own addiction. I'm addicted to experience, she says. My brother chose drugs, my father alcohol. I'm addicted to experience. I can't get enough. Art, fire dancing, hanging out with strange people, home remodeling. She was in Kelso last week, for God's sakes, building a greenhouse. And on her drive home down the coast, she felt some of that old familiar anxiety coming out of the blue. It may have been the many homeless folks she saw along the road, reminding her, she said, of how quickly any of us could be there if some of the pegs fell out. I could, not, I could see how that could happen to me in six steps. But then Essie added this, I couldn't stop thinking about how lucky I am to be where I am. I'm living on the coast, even when I'm sitting in traffic, I'm next to the ocean. I am always needing to remind myself to be grateful. It's easy to be negative. It's similarly easy to be grateful. A lot of people growing up in a situation like I had would have a lot more problems. I feel lucky. I had an example of what not to do. I saw my dad and my brothers. Maybe it's coincidence, the grace she brings to conversations with strangers. You wonder on nights like this, when we parachute, when I parachute into a world of teenagers who need a little help and a small scholarship for any sort of dream to come true, we never know if the dinner, the banquet, the experience is better at filling the hole in us than it is in filling the hole in them. Can I prove that these scholarships really make much of a difference? I've not spoken at length with Kalia, Lane, Julietta, all of whom you're gonna to hear tonight, or any of the other 539 students who've shared in Al Forthen's legacy over the last 18 years. Maybe Essie Matheson is just as Springsteen would say, tougher than the rest. She's laughing. That might be true, but I'm guessing this. Maybe these nights together matter because they aren't meant to predict who's going to make the most of this small spoonful of opportunity. They're meant instead to open the window in the wall that separates us from everyone who isn't as lucky as we were. To provide a safe, nurturing place for 17 and 18 year olds who may not be able to bank on one when they go home tonight. And they're asking us, asking us to be still just long enough to wonder how a young woman who was routinely manhandled, shoved into fireplaces and small drawers can grow into a woman who is thoughtful, grateful, reflective, and devoted to relieving all the pain and trauma she can reach with her own heart and hands. Al Forthen understood the possibility and the power of such transformation and reconciliation. Given half a chance and a $4,000 scholarship, S.E. Matheson is carrying on his work. And I'm heartened that so many people in this room have the opportunity to do the same. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kalia. Um, I wanted to be able to share a little bit of my story and how I ended up here in this room tonight and what made me apply for the scholarship in the first place. I learned the definition of foster care at the age of five, and it was something I was always afraid of. Um, and even though I was afraid and even though I didn't want them around, little did I know that DHS, the Department of Human Services, would become a critical part of my life from that point forward. 
Caseworkers and police officers taking me in and out of the child welfare system seemed so normal to me as it was my normal. And although I know the ins and outs of it so well, it's a concept that I would never wish upon anyone else here. And it's a concept that I wish I never had to know, but DHS is what I think for, for keeping me alive. I felt constant fear and I knew my life didn't feel normal because it didn't match with the stories that I would read in my childhood books or the movies that I would watch on Netflix or the Disney shows that I would see on the TV here and there. And I still find it strange how so many people don't know what I know and they don't know what DHS will even stand for because not everybody has to live a life in a world where you're constantly worried about security and safety and having to be thrown back into abusive and neglectful environments repeatedly and not knowing if you would live to see another day. It wasn't until I was 16 that I learned that I was living a life that some people thought only lived in fictional movies. Throughout all the hardships and trauma I've experienced, academics was the only thing I considered to be my way out. I used schoolwork as my motivation for survival to push through my lowest times as it was the only piece of my life I had control over for 16 years. It was my way of coping with the painful events thrown at me and gave me some glimpse of hope that I would make it out. Due to my biological mother's actions and her choices to choose drugs and substances first over everything, my sisters and I never had any level of stability. She has unfortunately given her life to drugs and she now doesn't know how to physically or mentally function without them. And although it's really sad for me to think about, I don't know my mom and I don't know how she would be without them. And my father has always been absent from my life, not wanting anything to do with me as I equaled child support bills instead of being his kid. And my other family relatives never knew how to break the abusive patterns themselves. So that means that I was left here and I had to figure it out on my own. And although I will always love the family I know, I had to learn how to make my own future because I just wanted them to find their way out as I've been trying to work for, for my own life. From my knowledge, neither my biological parents graduated college or held enough stability in their lives to have a job. And I find it to be very important to be the first person in my family to be able to do that. So I know that about 35% of foster youth throughout the country graduate high school and only about 2.5% earn their bachelor's degree in college. Some part of me is grateful that my life was designed like this so I can use my life journey and incorporate it to help others. I wanna be able to use my whole future to be able to help other foster kids like me by becoming a caseworker. And although the past, I'm almost 18 years old, has been very rocky and rough, going through many levels of abuse, going through homelessness, in shelters, bouncing around, not knowing what a mom is supposed to be, what a dad is supposed to be, what am I supposed to be, because who am I? I'm grateful that I've been able to find the other side of the road. And I'm now, as I said, almost 18 years old. And 12 years have passed with me being in and out of different situations, but I'm not afraid of my experiences anymore because I've been a given to do more, or I've been given a chance to do more than survive. And I want to be able to take this opportunity more than anything. I want to be able to help, help youth who are stuck in similar circumstances, because no matter how a kid ends up in foster care, we all end up in the same position because we have no control over our situations to which the scholarship is immensely helping me for my upcoming future at Oregon State University to earn my sociology degree. And throughout all of this, the rockiness and the unknowns and the completely scared and alone feeling, I couldn't be more thankful for this incredible financial support. My family who's over there at that table who came to see me tonight, my CASA who's also over there. I have an amazing attorney friends who couldn't make it because it's a little drive from Oregon City, and overall an amazing caseworker as well who couldn't be here because she's sick. <laughs> but I wouldn't have been able to do all this by myself, and although I have tried to do a lot, I couldn't be more grateful for them. And I'm currently in the process of changing my last name to Hope. I think that sometimes we kind of find ourselves in a very rough situation where it's hard to find the other end. And when I was a young, I think I was around six or seven years old, I got told by a caseworker to hold on to hope. And then the next time I was in foster care, I got told to hold on to hope again. And there was a point, maybe around 10 or 11, where I'm like, I don't even want to hear that word anymore. 
But then I learned the, abbrevi the abbreviation, hold on, pain ends. And that's something that I've held on ever since. So I'm in the middle of changing my last name to Hope. And that's something that will stick with me. And I hope that it can stick with you guys as well. Thank you. Hey y'all, my name is Lane. I use he, him pronouns. I'm 18 and I'm a senior at McDaniel High School. It is so wonderful to gather here today to celebrate all of these young people who have been able to achieve incredible levels of success despite facing adversity and intense tragedy that would cripple most people. We here today have chosen not to be defined by our experiences with addiction, but rather our ability to overcome grief and hardship and transform these negative experiences into opportunities for growth and reflection. I'm so honored to be in such venerable company and I'm so motivated by the passion and resilience displayed in this room. I first had the Al Forthen scholarship sent to me by a friend a few months after my dad had passed from an overdose. I wasn't even sure that I had wanted to apply at first. I hadn't processed everything that had occurred and I knew it would be painful and challenging to write about the impacts that addiction had had on my family. So I took my time working through the application. When I first read over it in October of last year, I couldn't bring myself to complete it. It was too much to handle between the emotions I was grappling with and the constant rumble of everyday life. So I pushed it aside and moved on content to banish any consequential reflections upon the impact of addiction on my family to a therapy session long in the future. But nevertheless, a few months later, I saw a flyer for the scholarship and felt much more prepared to put pen to paper. I began by writing the somewhat easier essays that relied on academic thinking, but I could only put off the difficult stuff for so long. And as I started writing about the impact of addiction, the emotions began to flow. I cried more than a few times, something that I had not allowed myself the time or space to do before writing these essays. And I knew that when I had finished the application, whether or not I received the scholarship, I had benefited greatly just from putting my thoughts and feelings on the paper. But of course, I stand here today, a recipient of the Al Forthen Scholarship, and I am so grateful to have received this money in support of my education. Um, I'll be attending Willamette University in Salem, Oregon next year to study public health and public policy um, on a pre-law track. The Al Forthen Scholarship will be a very helpful outside source of funding that will allow me to continue doing the community work I'm so passionate about. Addiction prevention is an integral part of public health work, and it is my hope that I will be able to create health policies that encourage treatment and support services for people and families impacted by addiction. I'm so excited to also continue advocating at the county and state levels for increased access to health care. It is again thanks to this scholarship that I will be able to pursue my goals in the community and beyond. And I'd like to finish this out with a quote that my father lived by and that I try to live by as well, which is to be your most authentic self. Thank you. Dear committee members, donors, recipients, and loved ones, my name is Julieta. I'm here today because I'm one of the recipients of the Al Fordham Scholarship. I cannot express my gratitude that I have for the Volunteers of America. Quite frankly, I didn't expect to be standing up here tonight with you all, but I'm very thankful for the chance I have been given. I almost didn't even get the chance to apply because of how hectic, how hectic life got. Like many, my life lacks st stability, but I don't allow it to interfere with my schoolwork. However, I applied to this scholarship because of the circumstances of my family. With this scholarship, I will receive the support I need to continue with my education and to be successful. Currently, I am only relying on scholarships and loans for my higher education. My mom has her own responsibilities with a single income, limiting how much support I will receive from her, especially when it comes to paying tuition. Alcohol and drug addiction have affected many of my family members, but due to alcohol and drug addiction in my family, I lost my best friend, who was also my dad. My dad will not be able to attend my graduation or be aware of my accomplishments and future plans due to his addiction. 
Because of his relationship with alcohol, it ruined our family. I believe he used alcohol as a coping mechanism for his trauma. I just wish he would have known he had other options. I want this to be a reminder that these opportunities have a crucial impact on younger generations. As you are showing a sign of hope to break the cycle of addictions our families have been through. You are providing support to kids who have not felt supported in the past. When we are not given the same support as our peers, it makes it harder to believe in yourself when no one believes in you. Having a parent or family member of a addicted to drugs or alcohol makes it easier for the generational cycle of addiction to continue. Children of addicts are affected in many different ways, including, but not limited to, abuse, increased difficulties in academic settings, fewer household resources, and a greater risk of addiction and mental illnesses. Scholarships and opportunities like these help break the cycle of generational addiction and poverty. This scholarship will benefit me in reaching my goals because it will reduce financial stress, allowing me to study and learn more leading to better grades and continuation of academic achievements. In the fall of 2023, I will be studying abroad in Costa Rica before transferring to the University of Oregon in the fall of 2024. I plan to be a contrib contributing member to my community by studying environmental science. I would like to see new ways of living and have the chance to explore on my own, which is why I'm choosing to study in Costa Rica. I wanna have a career where I am helping someone or something, but I have developed a specific interest in preserving the earth. My ultimate goal in my education is to transition to a local university as we need more educated women and minority representatives. Your generosity and support will undoubtedly have a significant impact on my academic journey. Thank you. This is gonna try to raise this up just a little bit. Okay. Uh, before we announce uh, this year's uh, award recipients, I would just like to say uh, it's very humbling to be a part of this. And I think back and see the emotion with Greg about Al and think about his spirit living through Greg and the ripple effect with all of you wonderful students who have your whole life ahead of you. And that is really what this is all about. And I would just uh, remind you guys that you don't have to make a lot of money to be wealthy. And what's happening in this room is people helping others that need it. And that's what life is really all about. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, Steve, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, we're gonna do this and an announce the names of the scholarship recipients in two parts. The first is gonna be those, the names of those who couldn't be here tonight. Luke and I are gonna alternate. And then we're gonna read the names of um, the folks who could show up, um, the seniors who could be here. And the only thing, when you come up, um, please take a moment and tell all of us in the room where you're gonna be going to school next year. So I'm gonna start um, with Gabby Bale. Brianna Blakely. Riley Brown Martin. Alia Alinas. Alexander Flores Lopez. Morgan Geary. Yvonne Green. Kalia Hines. Shayla Jane. Gabriella Aminas. Tanner Kasecker. Danielle McLean. Alyssa Minnie. Shai Molthen. Ava Moore. Maya Murphy. Kiara Salas Moreno. Akina Stevenson. Alyssa Stout. 
any sign of ground. One of the better names on the program, Stormy Tecumseh. All right, so now these again, are, when we read your name, please come up. Uh, Luke and I are going to hand you your certificate. And again, give us, tell us where you're going to school. That'd be tremendous. Uh, and we will start with Jasper Carroll. I plan on going to Oregon State University for nuclear engineering. Wow. You want to wait up here? Because I think you're going to take a picture. Yeah. Yeah. Haley Everett. Um, I will be attending the University of Idaho for civil engineering. Alexa Hacking. Um, I'll be attending the University of, the University of Oregon for speech pathology. Dylan Holzman. I'll be attending Portland State University for health education. Uh, one of our speakers tonight, Kalia Hope. Um, I'll be attending Oregon State University for sociology. River Medina. I'll be studying at Oregon State University for um, paramedic medicine. Eleni Myers. I'll be studying at the University of Oregon for sociology and human services. Avery Nelson. I'll be attending Oregon State University for marine biology. Lane Schaffer. I'll be attending Willamette University for public health and public policy. Julieta Torres Vasquez. I will be studying in Costa Rica environmental science for my first year. And finally, Elizabeth Valencia. I plan on running cross country from Multnomah University on a pre-med biology track. Can, can we have a final round of applause for this year's Al Forkman Scholarship winners? Just really neat.
We're now gonna show our Al Forthen uh, scholarship video. So I wanna give a shout out to uh, Jordan Kent and Jonathan uh, Simons who were kind enough to donate their time to uh, help produce this video. And it was again, it was a connection with Luke that uh, introduced me to Jordan. And it's a wonderful video. First time we've shown it in public. So enjoy. Welcome everybody, my name is Jordan Kent and I'm here to tell you about the story of a very special man, Al Forthen, and the Memorial Scholarship Fund that was set up in his name that will help the lives of the next generation. And Al's story begins here at the Volunteers of America Building Men's Residential Center in Portland, Oregon, where Al, like so many of the men that come through the doors here, are given a second chance to better their lives. My name is Greg Stone and I, my role here at VOA is I'm the program director of the Volunteers of America Men's Residential Center. The Volunteers of America is a nonprofit that's been around since 1896, so a little bit over 125 years now. And I've been working for them for 31 years. I had the honor and privilege of starting the Men's Residential Center back in 1990. We do everything from youth programs with childcare up to senior adult daycare, daycare programs. Um, the program that I work with we are a large residential alcohol and drug treatment program. We're funded and licensed through the state of Oregon, and uh, we serve men who come out of the criminal justice system. So Al Forthen was a, a gentleman who grew up here in Northeast Portland. He uh, was actually born in Banport, and when it flooded, his family moved in over by Concordia University. And uh, he basically went to Jeff, was a, a 1963 graduate, mm -hmm. and uh, was big into sports but also like, you know, many people who uh, grew up in the neighborhood got involved in the lifestyle of drugs and crime. So Al spent about 25 years in that lifestyle. And he was, you know, one of those people that had a lot of charisma, a lot of charm, and was pretty good at the, the, uh, that lifestyle of being in the game. He spent that 25 years as a heroin addict, a major you know, supplier of drugs and trafficking. And uh, when he got clean though, he came into our program, we actually moved in here. Uh, we were in a temporary location while we went through conditional use, moved here on April 30th, uh, 1992, and Al had actually come into our program a week earlier. So he basically came back to his neighborhood that he grew up in and uh, got clean after many other treatment failures and got clean for the first time in his life. And Al said, you know, basically this program, you know, he really credited it with his ability to change his life. And he said, you know, it was the first time in my life where I felt like I was treated like a human being and that people cared about me. It was the first client that I hired to work here in 1996. And uh, he spent 10 years working with us and just was an amazing counselor, just had a heart of gold, tremendous love and passion to help people in recovery. Uh, you know, he, he just had this wonderful ability to connect with people. And uh, the men just had, you know, tremendous respect for him. You know, obviously a person that had been there, you know, he was nine times in prison and, uh, you know, had transformed his life. And just his passion and commitment to help people was, you know, you know, just, Oh, it was a wonderful gift that he gave to people. Uh, he str uh, struggled with uh, COPD, cr uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, mm -hmm. and had real struggle breathing toward the end of his life. Mm -hmm. But he had this passion to keep working, and uh, basically, he, you know, we had those big set of stairs. You have to get up to the uh, all the offices were up here on the second floor. He would carry his breathing machine up the stairs. Mm -hmm. You know, he was committed till the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, three days before he passed away, he was doing a twelve-step meeting on his deathbed. Wow. You know. And, it's like, what a testament, yeah. you know, just of his love and commitment to help people choose recovery, mm -hmm. you know, and so I just had a you know, deep love and respect for who he was, you know, just a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. I was getting emotional about it, but uh, so he passed away in 2006, but he had 14 years clean time. Mm -hmm. And I had the honor of uh, speaking at his service. And yeah, I said, basically, he was a, the Michael Jordan of recovery, you know, just, touched so many people's lives mm -hmm. such a deep and profound way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a true gift to be a part of that, of, you know, being a small part of his journey. Jesus washed away my, my troubles while I'm traveling here below. 
Well, we're here in Greg's office and you saw just the compassion and care that Greg has for his fellow man and his relationship and friendship with Al was something that was really special. And when you think back on the way that they're looking to honor Al with this memorial scholarship, it's incredible to just see the difference it's made in the lives of others. So we're gonna take an opportunity to hear from a handful of these scholarship recipients that have had to work so hard on their own just to overcome some adversity, a hand that they were dealt that they didn't get a chance to choose. And now with the aid of this scholarship, just that little bit of help, the difference it makes in their lives, the doors that it has opened. And when you see the lasting impact of Al Forthen and what he set forward with his way to help his fellow man, you'll see the huge and tremendous difference this scholarship can make in the lives of others. Hi, my name is Samantha and I am a nurse at um, OHSU Dornbecker. I always wanted to go to college. It's always been a um, goal of mine. I always wanted to play soccer in college and um, so I always knew that to afford college I was gonna have to work my way towards a scholarship. Actually it was pretty therapeutic to be able to write everything out and um, go through this process and um, I think some of the questions were about um, the history with my um, dad and his um, alcohol abuse and um, some of my other family members so I just went into those stories and talked a little bit about my childhood growing up. So I say therapeutic because um, I think having an opportunity to share a story when you're not when it's something you've kept to yourself for most of your life or that, you know, being involved in so many things in high school, not, I didn't share that side of me um, and my struggle with um, some of those things with my family and how that impacted my home life. Um, so it was therapeutic to be able to write that all out and then to meet other people through the process who were coming from similar situations or, um, struggled with those things themselves and so it just was really eye-opening to meet new people and identify with those people in a way that I, I didn't with some of my other close friends. Um, and then once I realized that I won and um, that my dreams were going to come true and like I was going to, I was definitely on path to achieve the things that I wanted to achieve, that just gave me confidence. It um, gave me reassurance that I can do whatever I'm, you know, whatever I want to do with my life. It was just really also inspiring. My name is Casey Ragianti. I'm a global product manager at Adidas. Um, grew up in Portland and I'm very thankful and blessed to still be here. So I was couch surfing at the time um, with a neighbor and just getting acclimated to, to that lifestyle. And now I'm thinking about what's next. What am I going to do? Figured college was the, the best opportunity for me. I felt like it was my only chance because of how I was like raised, how I grew up. Um, drugs, alcohol, um, parents were somewhat emotionally and physically abusive and I just felt deep down that without college I'd end up not necessarily in the same paths. I didn't want to end up like my family. I wanted to be different but I also wanted to be proud of my life and make a difference and, and do more than just what my parents did growing up. For me growing up, it was always like, I'm just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I never really shared my story because I didn't feel like it was different from other kids at school. I always felt like everybody's dealing with these types of problems. And, you know, finding help and assistance through mentors growing up, you start to realize that the way you grew up wasn't normal. It was vastly different from a lot of other people. So for me, it was is that turning point of getting kicked out of the house, finding some mentors, confiding in them, and then just learning that your story should be told, embrace it. Um, and then there's people out there like the Al Fortham Scholarship that will help make your dreams a reality um, and assist you because they know um, and support those that have struggled growing up. It, it came down to instilling confidence in me, validating my story, um, believing in me, which going growing up in a drug and alcohol abused home, it I didn't have a lot of that. And to, to hear you won and we believe in you here is your chance to go to college was extremely impactful um, and it's something that i think about especially life is hard i deal with a lot of challenges but i can't forget how blessed i am and the ability that the scholarship's given me going forward um, to keep trying 
keep trying to do better and, and make a difference where I can. Okay, my name is Vinicia. I attend Portland State University full time and I'm studying pre-med, majoring in psychology, minoring in business, and I have a job full time too. If I didn't have a scholarship, I for sure wouldn't think I could go to college because of the way my life was just set up at the time. I've always been working full time like my whole life and it started in high school as soon as I was eligible to get a job. I was just working too much. So I couldn't show the I couldn't show my high school academics that I was able to go to college. But Al Forthen was willing to hear a story that got me accepted to college, you know? Like they gave me the money to go because other schools wasn't gonna really pay for it. Because, you know, when you're working full time all the time, you have to make up that money that, you know, you don't have. But when Al Forthen gives you that money, you can take time off and just really focus on academics because when people, fail to realize is that school is a full-time job. So to work two full-time jobs in high school was, you know, it's kind of insane. I honestly would not be in this position without the Alfredson scholarship because it was really the money. Like college is all about money. Like you can't go to college without money at all. So no, I wouldn't have because then I wouldn't have somebody, you know, to help me pay for my way to get in. Now that I'm in, I figured it out and I made excellent grades. It's way up there, you know, like it just really helps you get there. And if I never had the Al Fortune scholarship, I wouldn't have gotten there in the first place because I would have been working full time. <laughs> well, those are just some incredible stories. It's just a small sampling of the number of lives that have been changed because of the Al Fortin Memorial Scholarship. And now it's your opportunity to make a difference. We heard from Greg earlier the difference this scholarship fund has made since 2006. But now collectively we can come together and better more lives and give more of these young men and women a fair chance to open up doors in their lives. They've already had to overcome so much at such a young age and you see just the incredible fortitude of these young individuals. The least we can do is to continue to give them a hand. So please check out the website below. You'll find more information on how you can donate and let's continue to carry on the legacy that Al Forthen set forward of helping his fellow man. And we can all play a big role if we just play a small little part. Hi there, everybody. My name is Essie Matheson, and I am so happy to be with you all this evening. I've loved hearing everybody's personal stories, and I'm sure that a lot of us can relate to a lot of what each other have been talking about, uh, and I'm just so honored to be a part of it. Uh, when I was first approached and asked to speak here this evening, uh, my insecurities shone through a little bit to for me wondering, of course, uh, why out of all the voices you could be listening to what right now, what about me is interesting enough? <laughs> um, but a good friend of mine reminded me that honesty in itself is always interesting and that's what I can lead with. <laughs> uh, today I stand before you as a licensed massage professional, an artist, a queer woman, a fire dancer, uh, the only college graduate in my family, uh, professional silly person and a performer. <laughs> uh, but almost a decade ago, when I accepted the scholarship, I was a frightened kid uh, who had no idea what I was doing with a fake it till you make it kind of attitude that I still hold today. Uh, like many of you here, I had uh, less than ideal circumstances growing up. Um, my parents, who didn't mean to have children had three, so that's not a great start. <laughs> and uh, my father was an alcoholic. My brothers were both drug addicts and I uh, received different forms of abuse throughout my life. Uh, my brother started having children very young and which made me kind of their additional parent as there wasn't uh, sustainable parents for them. 
um, they became more like my kids. And when I turned 18, I fostered my niece and nephew for a few years. Uh, they're now with their birth mom and they're doing great. Um, and they came here with me 10 years ago uh, when I was fostering them to accept uh, my scholarship. Um, the problem in a lot of these households is that you've had to grow up too soon. Uh, you've gone through different forms of trauma and you've had to mature sooner than you would like. Uh, a lot of us have dealt with self-harm and not being able to accomplish our goals or make our grades even if we so desire to based on our life circumstances. I have learned in my short time on earth that you cannot simply and ignore and repress things forever as badly as you might wish to. You can say it's good enough, you can say it's fine, it will get better, but at a certain point, you cannot avoid the things that are taking up your mind, space, and energies. You either need to make a change for the better or you rot from the inside. I had to make that choice for change and growth. I'm still not done. I'm always improving. And uh, I think like me, you guys are resilient. Uh, Steve Dean asked me uh, last week when he interviewed me how I've been able to keep such a positive outlook and mindset and uh, casual cadence when talking about trauma. And I think after thinking about it for a while, my answer to that is that one of our greatest freedoms in this world is how we react to things. In times of hardship where you feel powerless, scared, and you can't seem to see beyond the horizon, I just encourage you to breathe in through your nose, think of all that you love, and know that this storm will pass. I encourage the students here today to love themselves and have patience with this journey, to not submit to others' plans and motives and trust your gut and heart, to let go of energies in this life that don't serve you, push yourself, but be gentle, and most importantly, take care of yourself. Remember that this is a time of transition and growth. We'll get there. The envelopes on your table are for donations. Your donations mean so much to people like me and to people in this room. I wouldn't have been able to accomplish my goals without the scholarship. I didn't have assistance, I didn't have help. Uh, and, and as with other scholars mentioned, it was very therapeutic and cathartic to uh, have a safe space to share because uh, there's not many opportunities or places like that where we can freely talk and share about our trauma. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I feel so honored to be a part of this today and really lucky that uh, it worked out. I was able to come. So thank you all so much. And uh, yeah. <laughs> What a wonderful evening, boys. Such a such an honor to be a part of this scholarship and uh, support all these students. Thanks so much to our presenters tonight and uh, the students who presented. Just a true heartfelt moment for me to be a part of this and uh, share it all with so many wonderful people. So thanks so much. We truly appreciate you all coming out tonight. If you are able to donate and support the scholarship, please do that as you exit out. Um, I think we have a square in the back if you wanna give a credit card donation that way. But uh, you can do the uh, cards also, and we'll be collecting those as you walk out the door. For the students and their families, feel free to uh, take the uh, flowers from the uh, tables and uh, plenty more goodies in the back. So if any of the students want to come up and take pictures as you with your families, feel free to do that. But again, from deep, depth, deep, depth of my, the depths of my heart, I truly appreciate you all coming out tonight and supporting these amazing kids. So thanks so much.